I think it's about time that we talk about Witness. It has been three years since the album came out. It dropped on June 9th of 2017. It's Katy Perry's fourth record. Many want to say that it's her art pop, but I consider it its own thing for many reasons. Let's get down to the thoughts. As we all know, this was the darkest time for former American sweetheart Katy Perry, and I need to give some context before we talk about the music. Let us head back to before Witness. The year is 2015, and Katy Perry's literally at the top of the world. Left Shark is a meme, Obama is president. The Super Bowl performance has people hyped up for the follow-up to Prism, which not only added two number one hits to her impressive list of records, but an amazing tour as well. Things are going great. Katy Perry 4 seems to be a surefire hit of a record, but then came the speed bumps. Don't get me wrong, I'm not blaming these people for Katy Perry's uh, disastrous era, but we cannot downplay the role that these two people played in dismantling Katy Perry's momentum. Those two people being Taylor Swift and Donald J. Trump. I think we've heard way too much about the feud, but for those people who don't know, some background dancers on the Red Tour ditched to be on Katie's Prismatic Tour because they just felt bored. That upset Taylor. She wrote Bad Blood, hinted it was about Katy Perry, and the rest is history. Looking back, it seems kind of dumb and petty. Now, all of these kind of occurred during Taylor's Imperial 1989 era, and we know how Swifties are, so not a generally good look to divide the general public like that. Regardless, Katy Perry still retained some form of relevancy and power. Rise, a song that she released in 2016 for the Rio Olympics, charted at 11 in its first week with minimal promo other than being featured in a few NBC ads. No, but really, what I think played an integral role in Witness's downfall was Katy Perry's devotion to uh, working closely with then-presidential candidate Hillary Clinton's campaign in 2016. Instead of recording and promoting a fourth record, Katy Perry spent most of 2016 making campaign appearances. She even performed Rise at the DNC and made it extremely obvious that she was a Democrat, unlike a certain starlet who waited for reasons. No shade, please don't ratio me again, Swifties. I'm sorry. I don't care what your politics are, but objectively, she basically lost a good, I don't know, 30% of America at the time. For good reason in her own mind, but legit, there's a reason why most pop stars stayed relatively apolitical at the time of the album's release. Trump ended up winning the presidency, as we all know, and well, shit. I personally have a theory that Witness was supposed to be a completely different album conceptually and that her decision to go into what would later become infamously called woke pop was mostly Trump's election's fault. After all, it would have been irresponsible in Katy Perry's mind to release a Teenage Dream 2.0 or another prism at such a contentious time in human history. Katy clearly thought by going political she would be making waves and a statement and people would love her for it. Now enter Chain to the Rhythm. The promo for the single was actually really cool. She chained a bunch of disco balls around major cities and people could plug in their actual headphones to listen to a preview of the song. The performances that she did for the song remain some of the most visually interesting stuff that she's done in the past few years. When she brought out a skeleton version of Theresa May and Donald Trump out at the Brit Awards, the falling house in the background, the music video being this hella sick dystopian hell that weirdly enough is more relevant today than it was back then. Katy Perry's vision and her artistic style and the people that she brought out to work with her during this single, a very good choice right there. Underrated and possibly some of the coolest stuff that she's done yet. The song I actually really did like. I was obsessed with it. It made my top 10 that year in playback. Skip Marley's feature was well placed and while people call it a pandering mess, it's a solid first single and her hair during the promo cycle. Oh god, let's talk about the hair. We need to talk about the hair. I see so many people say that her shaving her head killed the era and I do agree partially. Katy Perry, prior to this era, relied heavily on evoking the timeless aesthetic of a pinup model. She was the epitome of American femininity. She served immaculate, classic looks that made both guys and girls swoon. 
The haircut ended up being a mix of Karen and Miley Cyrus. People are shallow as hell, ironically. I mean, it is pop music after all, proving many of the points she wanted to make. I think an interesting theme of the era was her abandoning what made her so popular to see who exactly would stick around. Who would be her witness? Single 2, Bon Appetit, would become the death knell for this era, in my honest opinion, after rumors of an Ariana Grande duet spread in February around the time Chain to the Rhythm dropped, Katie released this song in April featuring Migos, fresh off controversy for being homophobic. I remember being on Stan Twitter around the time this dropped and her gay stands were so annoyed. Woke Twitter said following up Chain to the Rhythm with a sex jam was problematic. Katy Perry would later go on to say that the song was about sexual liberation. Um, okay. Needless to say, it flopped so hard that the third and basically final single, Swish Swish, was rushed out. Featuring Nicki Minaj and being an indirect response to Bad Blood, one would think that this would have smashed, but it only peaked at 46. Shit was looking dire here. I like Swish Swish, and I think it was forward thinking for its time. Nicki's verse is clean and fun. Do you guys remember that awkward period of time where she was too lazy to go onto the actual film set so she'd just CG herself into the music video? The video was just a cringy mess of memes, but honestly, it was Katie having fun and probably one of the few times she looked like she was having fun this era. And let's not even talk about the SNL performance, which had her overshadowed by Backpack Kids and uh, the Bon Appetit one during that episode. Um, however, the ultimate ultimate promo, the last gambit, one can say, was when Katy Perry, in an act of brilliance and possibly desperation, announced Witness Worldwide. Four days in a live streaming house on YouTube for the world to see, culminating in a concert, and the memes that we got from this. Let us not forget the devastating therapy session. It is probably the most iconic moment from this era, and truly a moment we shouldn't laugh at, it was a cry for help and empathy. Just when Katy Perry thought she was out of the woods and she had number one secured, Taylor Swift came out of nowhere and restored her missing discography to Spotify on the same day as the album's drop. Nevertheless, Witness hit number one, but at what cost? Promo after the album was definitely cut short because, well, post-album singles are dead on arrival due to streaming, and while Katy Perry embarked on a successful Witness World tour and dropped a Hey 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 music video, the era was just about cooked. It's time to talk about the legacy of Witness. The world was after Katy Perry in 2017. While she did commit many unforced errors in the rollout of the album, it was clear that people were really just out to see her star fall in a way that was arguably more vicious than people were during the art pop era. Witness isn't really that bad of an album by any means. I think she proved on it that she could hold her own without Dr. Luke, who was engrossed with his lawsuit with Kesha at the time of the album's release. Would single choices have saved the era? Three years later, um, I don't think they would have saved the album. In my honest opinion, Katy Perry for much of the 2010s was America to me. She represented the dream of making it big. She was our California girl. We saw her get divorced in her own 3D concert movie, for God's sakes. Yet, she still evoked the glamour and the magic of many classical tropes throughout the years. She is and was a star for all purposes. She represented a pre-Trump America culturally. She was non-divisive, apolitical, and just fun without much consequence behind it. There were even moments of cultural insensitivity sprinkled throughout, sure. Someone like her could not survive 2017. The shift to streaming era tactics, the soundscape of the time, going political, shaving her head, public gaffes like joking about Britney Spears' mental health. Um, and the only thing I have to do is like shave my head, which I'm really saving for a, a public breakdown. I'm down for that. What she was emblematic of died in 2016. The biggest tragedy was that we all witnessed it in real time and there wasn't much we could do to stop it. Pop stars live and die by public favor. It's part of the business and the tides were too much to overcome. I want to talk about a few tracks before I close out this video. The title track remains one of my favorite Katy Perry songs to date. It is mature, poignant, and totally snubbed by the general public and ironically Katy herself when performed on tour. 
her vocals, the production, the meaning, it's a thesis statement to a muddled story, but it slaps. Roulette is such a banger, I can't even talk about how this song could have spared the era of its fate. If she wanted to go apolitical, she could have dropped this. It would have smashed with a sexy music video. I love it. Deja Vu is a delight, even though I definitely abhor the Chinese water torture lyric. Miss You More, aka Bad Photographs, for you Prism stands who wanted that track. It's a moment. It's not as good as Thinking of You, but I think of it as a worthy successor. Power, let's talk about those drums, her voice. I feel like Power was a track for the original concept about women empowerment and just joy, but um, she kept it on here for us. Tsunami is just a very unique and fun track. I'm surprised she had it in herself to make a track like this. Pendulum would have been a huge, fun, little adult contemporary smash. I think Jeff Basker's work here is great. The choir, the sound. I would love an album with the sound from her. And finally, I want to talk about Act My Age. I think this one would have made a really fun single. It would have done well because it plays into Katie's self-referential playful mythos while portraying an interesting sense of maturity and reflection on her part. I think this album is so misunderstood. It was stoned to death by an admittedly bad release cycle, but it should stand on its own at some point. I hope people revisit it not as her woke album, but an album about someone who's crying out not only for attention, but for empathy during one of the toughest times in her life. I've made jokes about Witness, and I formally apologize for them. Katy Perry, I can't wait to see what you have in store for us this year with Katy Perry 5. Once again, guys, thank you so much for coming out to see my videos. I loved making this video so much, editing it and upping my game. I hope that you guys like, subscribe, follow me on all my socials, and tune into my live streams. I'm so grateful that I'm able to make these videos and I have time to really just uh, talk about the albums that impacted my life. Thank you so much. I can't wait to see you next video next week. It's melodrama.